Good evening, everyone. Think, uh, let's just uh, give everybody a few minutes to uh, dial in. And good morning to those who are joining us from Europe and America. I know it's a very early morning for Alex and Baxter here. So thank you so much for, for joining us uh, in the wee hours. We'll give it a couple more seconds and then we'll uh, begin. So without uh, further ado, I think uh, we've given uh, enough time. We do have quite a lot of people who've signed up. I think uh, almost 200 people have signed up for this event. So, you know, thank you for your patience. Uh, we'd, we'd like every, as many people to, to join us uh, before we start. But uh, I think we have our guests all ready to go. And uh, let, let's just uh, begin our first uh, Global Security Token Offering Panel 2020. Um, without further ado, um, let's bring up the slides, uh, Nigel. So quick uh, compliance uh, disclaimer, this is not an advertisement making any offer or calling attention to an offer or intended offer. Uh, but we are going to have a very intense intellectual discussion here around uh, STO. So um, ho hope you all are prepared. Um, you know, this event has been many months in the making and organized uh, by iStox. Um, our vision at iStox is to give equal access to the financial markets through a regulated, transparent, and community-driven platform. And we bring multi-asset classes in the private markets to your fingertips for you to invest and trade uh, all in one place. Um, for more information, of course, please visit iStox.com after this session. Now, tonight, uh, without further ado, we have truly a star-studded uh, lineup. Uh, first of all, uh, we have um, Baxter Hines, who is the author of the book Digital Finance, Security Tokens and Unlocking the Real Potential of Blockchain. This book was just released uh, two days ago. And we'll open the session with STO Basics and the Future of the Industry. Congrats on your new book, uh, Baxter. Uh, Baxter is also managing partner and co-founder of Honeycomb Digital Investments. He manages portfolios consisting of traditional assets, security tokens, and digital assets. He was formerly the managing director and portfolio manager at NFJ Investment Group, a subsidiary of Allianz uh, Global Investors. Next, we have Alex Nascimento, author of the book, The STO Financial Revolution. He has been a very strong voice and change maker in Los Angeles. And we're very excited to have him share on how SEOs have been progressing in the Western Hemisphere. Alex is a faculty member and co-founder of the UCLA Blockchain Lab and Blockchain at UCLA, where he lectures on blockchain business applications in addition to his role of managing director of 7CC, Blockchain Investments, a company focused in fostering the blockchain industry. We also have Professor David Lee, um, who is a professor at Singapore University of Social Sciences, chairman of the Global FinTech Institute and senior advisor at Sentinel Chain. He's also the vice president of the Economic Society of Singapore and council member of British Blockchain Association. As a Fulbright scholar at Stanford University in 2015, he started mentoring and investing in inclusive blockchain product projects. And he has also published a number of books on um, artificial intelligence, blockchain, quantum computing, and other emerging technologies. Uh, Prof. Uh, David will join me on the Q&A panel uh, at the end of the presentation from the two other gentlemen. This will be the first time we will hear diverse points of view um, from the Western Hemisphere and from Asia around what's happening in the blockchain state space and how it is transforming tra traditional finance. 
And I will not uh, hold back this event anymore. Baxter, please uh, kick off your presentation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Oyi, for the great introduction. And I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to work with all of you. I mentioned quite a bit in my book about iStocks when I first heard about how you had these just great partners that were, were backing you and you had uh, representation all over Asia to create these security tokens. It was just an incredibly exciting uh, thing for me to see. And it, it, it presented a, a wonderful opportunity to really uh, you know, get this awesome opportunity of, of uh, the, the, the tokenization of, of securities presents to us off of the ground. And it's, it's also tremendous to see uh, how forward thinking uh, Singapore as a jurisdiction is uh, towards this space. So uh, really excited to work with you. It's, it's, it's truly an honor. So today I'm uh, looking forward to speaking with you for a few minutes about uh, how uh, blockchain is going to disrupt the, the financial industry and it's specifically how the tokenization of assets will affect how we issue, manage, trade, and trade uh, our uh, securities. Uh, I think that you know, most people are aware of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but they are totally oblivious to the far greater uh, potential that uh, blockchain uh, provides. I think that the, the crypto is just sort of the first taste, the, the, the appetizer, if you will, of what's to come. I think you're going to see a lot of digital currencies starting to be put onto the blockchain, and then you're going to see a lot of real world assets uh, come on uh, as well. And so, you know, in my opinion, uh, belief. I think they're going to be trillions of dollars going onto the blockchain over the next decade. And I really believe that this is the biggest innovation in the financial industry since uh, the advent of the internet. So we have a, a, a huge amount to look forward to. Um, in a lot of ways, what we're doing is we're taking familiar instruments that you're already uh, well aware of, like uh, private equity, private debt, private real estate, uh, and other securities, and you're just putting a better, faster, cheaper wrapper around them. Uh, so, you know, today, again, we're going to talk about what is a security token? What are the benefits of these security tokens? Uh, who will be the beneficiaries? Uh, and why also they are safer than most people think. Uh, the general sentiment around this space of, of blockchain has to do with, with cryptocurrencies. And there are a lot of headlines that are sort of stuck in, in people's minds. Uh, there are a lot of safeguards uh, that, that, that STOs uh, provide that I think you're going to be very uh, pleased to, to, to hear about. So with that, yeah, we're on the, the uh, actually, would you back up, that should be one other slide before that, I believe. That, um, I'll, I'll just say a few other words um, here. Um, what to me is really great about uh, the, the blockchain is that it's helping connect projects to the capital that they need in a much more efficient way. If you think about what a security token is, it's really just a digital representation of real ownership in an asset. It involves linking real assets through distributed ledgers. Uh, an easy way to think about it is uh, all else equal, one token is the equivalent of one share uh, in an asset. And this tokenization due to its electronic form can bring about greater efficiency and liquidity uh, to markets. Um, so I think that because of this you know, big, big trend that's going to be global uh, in, in terms of its scale, uh, everyone who's in the financial industry is going to need to have a broad comprehension of how this technology works, uh, what it can affect, and what the consequences uh, will be for, for business. And we are really in the, the, again, the early stages of this large uh, secular opportunity to embrace uh, blockchain technology at, and, and how it, it will connect the traditional and digital uh, digital worlds. So um, uh, moving forward to the next slide, I'll just go over a quick illustration of how tokenization works. It's a, it's a pretty simple concept. As I said earlier, just think of, of uh, one token being the same as one share. What, what you're doing is you're taking, is, is the left hand uh, part of the slide is showing you're taking some kind of an asset, whether it's a, a, a dollar, whether it's a piece of real estate, maybe it's an intellectual property, you're taking the title to that asset and then you're putting it onto the blockchain. And the blockchain can then be used as a way to uh, you know, transfer, trade, track, audit, all of, all of these assets. And the representation will be um, made through the ledgers, these distributed ledgers, which blockchain is, is all about. And the ownership will be held in the form of a token as opposed to a a paper certificate. So there are all kinds of assets around the world that have been uh, put onto 
the blockchain already and are, and are, and are pioneering types of, 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 of assets that are using this, this new technology. I, I would mention uh, one here in the United States, the Aspen St. Regis, which is a hotel uh, in Colorado in a, in a popular ski destination. They issued about $19 million of tokens uh, to represent ownership in their hotel as they were raising money to buy and renovate uh, that property. So this isn't a, a fantasy. It's something that's real. It's being done right now. And um, it's being proven as a way, again, to, to manage these securities in a much more efficient way than we have in the past. Moving on to uh, the next uh, slide. Uh, I've got an example here that I think really shows you how um, anything of value, whether it's real estate, commodities, art, whatever it might be, uh, can be used to, uh, to, to, to back a security token. And what is, again, what's really great about these security tokens is that they provide title to regulated financial instruments uh, with the speed and agility of, of blockchain. Um, because of the programmable nature of blockchain, you can combine the latest in technology and the potential for automated world-class investor protections, regulatory compliance, uh, and customer service into the, to the security itself. That's something you obviously can't do with a, a paper certificate. And what this ends up doing is it, it, it drives down costs, it enhances flexibility of the, of the instrument, uh, and it opens up all kinds of new opportunities for new business models and, and revenue streams. And through these security tokens, the ownership and the transfer history of the underlying security can be digitally recorded onto the blockchain. Um, so you, it, this really allows for, for cutting out costs, for um, uh, increasing the returns that, that, that an investor would make off of, of, of a security, and also can help to eliminate risks that, that can, can, uh, can happen uh, in, in the marketplace. So in this case, uh, I have invested in the credit worthiness of an NBA player. So uh, this gentleman here that you can see on the slide, his name is Spencer Dinwiddie. He is the starting point guard for the Brooklyn Nets. They're an NBA franchise. He has a, a $13.5 million a year contract with the Nets. So he's got lots of cash flow coming his way. It's a guaranteed contract uh, from the Nets. So even if he gets injured, he still gets paid. Um, and he wanted to start his own business. Uh, Spencer calls himself uh, a tech guy with a jumper. So he has a, a huge interest in technology. That's sort of how he thinks of himself first. He's a basketball player second, but because of the opportunities and the economics of playing basketball, he wants to obviously put some of his time to, to that and not have to worry about um, issuing securities and all the laws around it. So what he decided to do to fund his uh, new business was to sell bonds based on his credit worthiness, put them into an ERC-20 token, which is a security token that is issued on the Ethereum blockchain. And he has hired a custodian, Paxos Trust, which is a New York-based uh, organization that's regulated by the New York Department of Financial Services. And he pays the investors, I'm one of them, a 5% a year interest rate. So you think about 5%, you know, it's, not a, it's not an earth-shattering type of, of investment, but in today's world where there are uh, you know, so many uh, so many people that need income and there's the, uh, there are low rates and even negative rates in parts of the world, 5% from an NBA player guaranteed. That's that to me is, is actually is, is very exciting. And uh, the blockchain can help Spencer to overcome a lot of the uh, onerous compliance types of, of issues that come along with issuing a security. So for example, this is a, uh, a security that can only be sold by, by U S law to uh, accredited investors. It has to be locked up for a year. And so as a result, the blockchain is going to enforce all that. I can't sell it to someone who's not accredited. It has to pass through all those checks on the blockchain. If I wanted to sell it today, well, I haven't held it for a year. So the blockchain is not going to let me do it. So Spencer doesn't have to worry about what I, the owner of the token does, because he has the blockchain enforcing all those rules for him. And he can, can go out and be a basketball player and, and and earn a lot of money, but still have the capital he needs to start his new business. So it's a win-win type of situation uh, for everybody. And I think it really shows, you know, how uh, new types of projects or new types of opportunities can be put onto uh, the blockchain in ways that would have been very difficult uh, through paper securities. So if we move to the, the next slide, uh, just, just really quickly, you know, the, there are so many advantages to these digital securities. Uh, they're going to create all kinds of transparency and auto 
automated verification of asset ownership. They're going to create access to liquidity for a lot of, of uh, securities that are difficult to trade. It's going to create all kinds of new avenues to access capital. You're going to, to see all kinds of new creation of financial products that we've never had before. I mentioned already automated compliance, uh, speed of settlement. That's another thing that's, that's uh, very interesting. If you have a security today, like a stock, say Microsoft, it takes you three days to get your money if you, if you sell it. With a, a digital security, uh, the potential for, for faster settlement is, is, is very great, and that reduces operational and custody risk. You're going to be able to collateralize assets much, much easier and have much more efficient use of balance sheets. Um, and then you're going to have a lot more confidence in the security because it's, it's so much easier to automate in digital, uh, excuse me, to audit when it's in digital form and, and do all kinds of, of, of analysis over the, the, the data's history. So soon as uh, securities become digital and uh, it becomes more wide stream, anyone's going to be able to send anything of value as easily as they can sending uh, an email. So real quick, I'll hit up two, two last slides just to talk about the potential of, of this market. Uh, you know, one of the things that we have seen uh, in, over the last few years in, in, in my last job, I worked for a firm that ran uh, what, what was one of, if not the largest small cap fund uh, of public equities in the United States. Uh, we had a small cap fund with about $10 billion. And I used to speak with the manager all the time. It was my, my colleague, uh, you know, just next door to me in the next office. And he used to complain all the time about how his universe, the number of publicly traded securities was decreasing over time. And as you can see on the, the, the chart here on the slide, you've seen a, in the last 20 years, roughly a 40% decrease in the number of public equities. But at the same time, the number of private companies here in the US has gone up by about fivefold. Companies, because of the onerous regulations or for whatever reason, they don't want to go public as fast as they used to. And what's a shame about that is that uh, small cap equities were for many years, one of the best wealth creation tools uh, for, for the middle class and for, for, for people that wanted to build wealth for their retirement. And so you take an example like a, a company, again, I'll use Microsoft in 1986, when it went public, it had a market cap of somewhere around $200 million. Uh, now today it's, it has a market cap in excess of a trillion dollars something like 50 million people benefited from that, uh, that rise in wealth that Microsoft created over those years. And so if we now have a mechanism, the security token that allows these smaller companies to remain private, but to have uh, liquidity, that creates all kinds of new opportunities for investors to diversify into asset classes that they want to get into. And again, it facilitates on the issuer side, the ability to, to, to create capital uh, and, and, and get the money together that they need to grow uh, their businesses. So that's an, an incredibly exciting thing that I think brings about, it's brought about from, from this, this new uh, security token type of platform. And then on the final slide, uh, one of the things that I, I would mention has to do with uh, the cost of capital of, of securities. Assets that are difficult and expensive to trade, they're penalized. Uh, their return has to be higher to justify that illiquid structure. So there's always a, a continuum of liquidity in the market. And private investments are, are typically the least developed on the liquidity front. And therefore, I think they're going to see the biggest benefit uh, from tokenization. So basically what, the, what this chart is showing is that the, uh, the less liquid you are, if you're something like venture capital, private equity, or, or timber type of, of uh, REIT, very hard to get access to those investments. It's also very hard to sell those assets. And so uh, one, as we said, the cost of capital is higher, but number two, a lot of investors just can't get involved in those kinds of, of asset classes because they, for whatever reason, either their investment policy standard won't let them or their cash flow needs won't let them. They just cannot afford to lock up capital for long periods of time. But by having this new type of, of security token instrument, this is going to unlock all kinds of, of potential to, uh, to lower costs of capital and to create diversification opportunities for a, a large swath of investors. So with that, let me, let me stop. Uh, I will mention one last thing. Please uh, take a look uh, uh, at, at my book that, that uh, was released yesterday. We're very excited about it. Uh, it talks about a lot of the topics that I've just covered uh, in a lot more detail, and it's available in Singapore 
through uh, electronic means. So you can buy it on Amazon, or uh, if you want to buy a hardback copy, it's uh, available at Open Trolley. So I'll hey. stop there and hand it over back to you, Oyi, and, and to Alex. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Baxter. Um, Alex, uh, you're up next. Excellent. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Oyi, and thanks for uh, inviting me for this. The whole iStocks team, very excited to be here. I've been following the progression of what you guys have been doing, uh, which, which has been trailblazing in the industry. So uh, um, Baxter did a great job in covering some of the key points of security tokens, and I'll try to give additional thoughts to it. So a little bit about me, as you mentioned, I teach uh, blockchain applications for business and security tokens here at UCLA, uh, University of California, Los Angeles. And I manage uh, 7CC Blockchain Investments, which is a company that advises and invests in the space. So I come from a trajectory of investing in tech companies and building this ecosystem at UCLA together with writing a book on security tokens, uh, which was probably one of the first textbooks on the topic which we cover regulatory and frameworks across the globe and the utilization of security tokens from a business perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So utility tokens uh, versus security tokens is a, a key aspect of understanding this, right? So a utility token is a token that gives you access to something. And it was what really got the market super excited about these token offerings. Uh, people were creating these tokens and putting them out in the market for fundraising. Uh, but essentially, as the market evolved, we created this division in the sand, which one is a token that should give you access to something that should not have a investment wrapper or or um, have an appreciation of value. It, it should just be a um, token that represents a product or a service. And here in my illustration, you can see it as a Disney dollar, right? It's a, it's a dollar that you can use at Disneyland to buy food and ride roller coasters and entertain yourself. So no appreciation of value, no investment, uh, profile. You're, you're just buying that fictitious dollar to get access to the variety of different entertainments that are available at Disney. And then in 2017, this concept of a security token uh, rised, which is a token that, um, a previous slide, please, Nigel. Uh, it's a, yeah, previous one. Thanks. So a security token rise, which is the concept of a representation on blockchain that has an investment capability or an investment profile that gives you appreciation to an asset, right? The interesting part of it is that it should be regulated and it should be federally regulated. This whole idea of a security token really rose from the SEC, the securities Exchange Commission in the United States, which deemed initial coin offerings a securities offering. And here, uh, again, in my illustration, I, I like to make this distinctions for my students. Disney dollars are utility tokens, a Disney stock. And here's for the people that are as old as I am, um, you used to receive a, a paper certificate, which is a stock, as a security token. So that's a very important distinction here. Um, next slide, please. So some of the key benefits, Baxter did a great job at touching on most of them, but cost of reduction and faster settlement is definitely what's driving the industry and the financial industry to look at automated solutions for compliance, for settlement, 
uh, for liquidity that are provided by blockchain technology. And that's why every bank hedge fund or investment firm we speak with uh, is super excited about this, right? One of the things I mention when I do these thoughts is uh, a piece of the puzzle that people don't usually think about it, which is revenue sharing or dividends. In the United in the United States, the entire United States only has about 3,000 companies that uh, pay out dividends. Why is that? It's because it's extremely costly to pay dividends. It's a, it's a massive work from a back office and bureaucratic perspective. But having this all automated on a blockchain makes it a lot more feasible for smaller cap companies or frankly, um, any company to pay out dividends. You can, like in the ICL days, do startup fundraising. Um, you limit the risk of redemptions because you have secondary markets that are operating 24 seven. And then you also have facility of transfer of ownership and tracking that. And for those that followed the 2008 financial crisis, we can remember how, how hard it was to track the ownership of who was holding the mortgage uh, bonds and the, and the lending infrastructure here in the United States. So, so security tokens really helps with that. Next slide. So what, are, what is the real progress of what we're seeing for security tokens? This is a little bit of a historical timeline of what we saw. Like I mentioned, in 2017, uh, ICOs were booming in, in, in the market worldwide. People were just different from an IPO where a company would be profitable would, or at least would show a strong business case to go public. Companies were going public on an idea. <laughs> and the Securities Exchange Commission of the United States saw that that was... Uh, securities offering by definition. Then we followed by in December having the Munchie uh, ICO that proved that and created the Munchie test in addition to the Howard test, which also was deemed as a security. Uh, very fastly in, in 2018, Bitcoin was considered a commodity, which was um, very positive for the entire industry. And we evolved into the SEC reviewing what would be the right frameworks and guardrails to issue a security token because in the United States, and it's important to, to mention here why this, the SEC of the United States uh, was considered for the longest time like the controller or the ruler of this ecosystem, uh, there's nothing more than just because the United States trades about 40% of global's equities and bonds. So if you're an institutional player, you're waiting to see what the SEC will say about this new asset class. So frankly, and, and we were very happy to see the SEC move forward in a very positive way in July, 2019, um, by allowing not only one, but two full public offerings, which means like anybody in the United States could buy it of a security token, which was of the props token and block stat. Uh, following along in November of 2008, uh, Ethereum was, was also being considered as it moves to proof of stake should it be a security? Should it be um, a commodity? Um, and we've been seeing lately great evolutions from the SEC as now the OCC allow, it's gonna allow commercial banks and, and retail banks in the United States to deal uh, with cryptocurrencies. And most recently the SEC also uh, is facilitating the settlement of digital assets. Next slide. So here are some of the latest news that we've been seeing. Uh, the SEC green lights investments funds delivered in security tokens, which is, is a key 
um, key case study for most security tokens would be for funds. We have over 15 countries that already defined regulatory frameworks. So, and Nomura blockchain reports makes a case for security token offerings. So we're, we're clearly seeing this becoming a serious business and a huge industry in the entire world. Next slide. Some of the things that are also happening, I like to point out as case studies around the world. So obviously we all know about iStocks, but iStocks is not alone in the space, right? We have the St. Regis Aspen token that's now being traded at T0, which is the largest uh, security token exchange here in North America. We have uh, the PIX in, in Brazil, which is this interbank or interfinancial payment system uh, covering all the financial institutions in the country, which also allows people to pay in crypto. Uh, we have service providers like Polymath, R3 Cordo, which is a network of banks, including Societe Generale. Uh, we have SDX, which is the Swiss digital exchange, which is under the original uh, Swiss stock exchange which is a cohort of institutional banks. Uh, we have JP Morgan selling their blockchain forum back to consensus. And NASDAQ, as, as we know, NASDAQ is a worldwide known brand offering a full-fledged solution for security tokens, like from zero to 100 custody and so forth. So iStocks is not alone in the space, which is great because the, it shows that the market is blooming. And there's a lot of space for iStocks to grow. And there's other, other players in other parts of the world um, charging at this opportunity. And it's important to understand that although we all hear that are fans of security tokens, we see a future for a global coherent and interchangeable network of security tokens. But securities are traded based on local jurisdictions. So that's why you're seeing all these different players targeting different jurisdictions. Next slide. Some of the problems and opportunities here that I just would like to point out, we still see a lack of liquidity as people get more familiar with security tokens that should, that should become uh, less of a problem. Unclear regulatory international frameworks, which is the whole opportunity here is how you would change these securities in a, in a global um, fashion. And that's still in the making from, from a lot of regulators around the world. And issuing platforms. Uh, issuing platforms are coming to fruition and a common standard is something that we're still working on. But the opportunities are huge, uh, not to mention illiquid assets just of currently traded, we have $70 trillion in equities and $92 trillion in bonds, which can be tokenized. And we have more than 4 billion people on the internet. And a good portion of that are unbankable or don't have access to these investments. Um, next slide, please. So if I would think about what is in the near future, I would say that we're gonna see a lot more STO financing, uh, exchange listings, and more marketplaces going live. We see a great amount of, of money being poured and locked into DeFi protocols, uh, crowdfunding and FinTech companies also offering security token services, uh, much higher liquidity as we have great players like iStock, providing these services and connecting investors to great investments and companies and new and, uh, and a lot more clear regulation. Um, as a final thought, next slide. I think that security tokens potential is very close to what we see in the computing world of Maros law, which we tend to overestimate the impacts of a security token in the short run and underestimated in the long run, which means that we're very excited about what it could be done today. And companies like iStocks and T0 um, and SDX are all coming to the, to the space. 
but I think we're significantly underestimating the huge potential of a security token we'll have in the entire globe and financial system uh, in the next coming years. Next slide. And that's uh, the reason we decided to write this book. It's already in the third edition. You can find it on Amazon or you can go to the URL and download it for free uh, with the code STO book dash I stocks all in caps uh, where we cover regulatory frameworks across the globe and how you can issue a security token in your jurisdiction aside from a lot of case studies. And my name is Alex Nascimento. Like I mentioned, it's a pleasure to be here and feel free to reach out uh, to me at LinkedIn if I can help you with anything. Thanks, Oye. Back to you. Thanks, uh, Alex. Uh, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, I've downloaded both your books and I'm, you know, sort of reading through them right now. And, you know, it really is in line with what we want to do. And so this has been super uh, interesting for me to hear two of you live talking about uh, SEOs. Um, you know, a little bit of a case study before we move on to, to Q&A. Um, iStox uh, sees itself as it's the case study in Asia, right? Um, what we set out to do was to use uh, blockchain as a base technology really to give access to um, investors into private markets. Um, and if you think about um, actually how interesting this space is, it requires not only the tech solving problems for the product, it also requires a regulatory infrastructure to be supportive and to align really what is uh, what I call offline online, right? Uh, that, that, that security tokens are properly recognized. Um, for example, the Singapore tax regulators have also come up with guidelines as to aligning um, um, digital uh, securities to, to the traditional. So uh, we just got out of the sandbox earlier this year. We're fully regulated by the MAS, the Monetary Authority of, of Singapore. And we have a number of licenses that allow us to operate uh, across issuance through to a secondary trading. And uh, this by itself is, is no mean feat that requires at least three licenses here. Uh, we have a team that we've built up from across traditional financial services, as well as all our young uh, tech engineers who are very excited about building something so exciting and so new. Um, we've done a number of deals now. We've actually issued, uh, uh, settled the bond, redeemed the bond, paid the coupon all through our, our um, the life cycle of that bond on the ISOX platform. Um, so we're pretty excited about how that works. We've also now uh, have three funds that we've actually issued and, and listed and trading on our platform right now. Uh, so they are available. Uh, what I find super interesting, for example, the middle one, which was a world-class hedge fund, uh, is a Singapore-based hedge fund that's the top, one of the top five global macro funds in the world. And uh, if you were a high, ultra high net worth individual, you get access to it. But if you were a high net worth individual, you probably won't be able to find $2 million, which is the minimum uh, entry ticket for, for this hedge fund. And so we've made this available at very small ticket sizes, uh, 20,000 um, for uh, in investors who want some exposure to a hedge fund, uh, but you know want to have a more balanced portfolio uh, approach to that. So, um, these are the three. We have a, for example, a real estate fund that's invested in the UK and Poland. Uh, it's a pre-IPO opportunity. Uh, again, we're super excited because we think this fund will eventually list on the main stock exchange. And therefore, um, we see this as sort of off, getting off-boarded on from our platform into the main stock exchange, um, which will obviously generate the returns for investors uh, in, in the midterm. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so how, how does it work? Uh, just very simply, I think just putting all the discussion in, into one page, uh, the platform itself takes the security um, and to a combination of a legal uh, as well as a, a, uh, the technology behind the platform. Uh, we put that onto our platform for our investors to subscribe in. Um, on our end, we do all the KYC AML. I noticed something that, Alex, you talked a bit about uh, the AM, uh, AML and KYC and the importance of that for a platform to um, make sure that we do all of that work. So we do all that uh, for our fund manager uh, um, issuers. We, we actually, all our investors are properly uh, under MAS regulations, which some of you know is actually uh, very strict. 
um, and so we run all of that. The cash that comes in from investors actually sit with the uh, DBS, which is the largest bank in Singapore, and they're all held in, in virtual accounts um, uh, within, within the iStox uh, uh, infrastructure. So they're actually held in trust by one of the largest banks in Singapore. Now, uh, when you invest, uh, what we do is the fiat tokens then get uh, matched with the security token. So it's a private blockchain, uh, it's a private permission blockchain. We're under obviously very big amount of scrutiny by uh, MAS around cybersecurity, safety of the of the security of the tokens, and um, and therefore you know we see ourselves uh, at the moment as one of the leading players uh, in this region. Next slide. All right, so here we are. The actually the most exciting part of the evening. Uh, we're going to open up this uh, to Q and A, and at this point, I'd like to. Um, introduce uh, Prof. Uh, David Lee, who has been uh, with us through this uh, webinar. Um, uh, the first question actually will be for uh, Prof. David Lee. I believe we're taking questions from, uh, the, uh, from, the, uh, from our participants as well. So please feel free to submit your questions and uh, you know, they'll feed them right through. First question for Prof. How supportive do you think governments in general are on STOs and digitized securities? And do you see a group of governments that are more supportive and who are the governments that are, you know, uh, still trying to get up the learning curve on, on this? First of all, I'd like to thank iStox for inviting me and it's a great honor to be able to know uh, Baxter and Alex today and sharing the same webinar. So it's great, great to be here. Um, your, your question is very interesting because I think um, the perspective on uh, investment and regulation is very different from this part of the world as compared to America or Europe. So maybe today I speak as an investor because I've been, I've been a stockbroker since 1993 and I was uh, the first few hedge funds in Singapore in 98 and then I did uh, private reads in the early 2000s. Uh, and then I decided to go back to academic in 2012. And one of the reasons is that I'm constantly looking for the next big thing. And one of one of the uh, criteria that I have is uh, negative correlation with the kind of portfolio that I have. So the key question is where is the area where I can find products which are LASIK, L-A-S-I-C, which is low margin asset like, innovative. Uh, scalable, and then the last one is the most important: compliance easy. Because I think uh, if you if you have a very if you buy into something which is compliance uh, not so easy or high or high risk and regulatory risk, uh, we have seen that uh, in the recent probably one of the largest IPOs when the government start looking at the entire landscape differently, then your investment actually is in is very high risk. So I think. Um, from from the regulator and the investor's viewpoint, the first thing is that uh, is you know you you have the risk, the financial risk, but we are now adding on another layer of risk and complexity, which is technology. So we have blockchain, we have cryptography, and we have quantum computing. There will be a transition period where we can be quantum resistant. So you have to have a very strong argument. For the regulators to say why I need to promote this STO. That's that's one reason. Second, given the kind of quantitative easing that we have at this moment, and if you want to promote STO and fractionalize um, the investment to the general public, uh, I think regulators will think very hard about this as well. And thirdly, when you have the technology where if you if you are only going to disrupt the industry and not create jobs. And you take the whole back room off and create a lot of employment in the kind of situation. As a regulator, they will think very hard as well. So this is, as an investor, I will think about all this. And, and also, um, from my viewpoint, it makes very little sense in, the sense in, in, in that the whole idea of blockchain is about reducing the cost of trust. But over here, um, we still have the security, which is one layer of trust. Then we put on the, the technology itself. We have to trust the technology as well. We are not disintermediating any risks at all. 
So if you want to convince the regulator to ensure the STO can go, then you really got to think about the arguments that uh, you know they they will have to push this agenda. Uh, and if you look at Asia, fifty percent of people are not included in the economy, and a lot more, maybe sixty or seventy percent, underserved by the financial sector. So you have to come in from the anger from financial inclusion. If you think the STO is going to take off, and the question is, that how do we make STO take off? Where it's compliant, easy, and it's acceptable by the government, and the, the general idea is then we have to serve the society. How do we do that? Why don't we not just not look at security token, but look at token security? And I talked about this maybe two or three years back, that uh, it is not the security token that we should focus on, because that is only a small part of the world population that will benefit, because it's, it's always the those who are participating in the market and have been in the market for 20 over years, and you need, really need the rest of to bring the rest of the people back to the economy and the financial sector. And the difference between security token and token security is that it is the security, and then you tokenize it. So you, as as a token, you don't need to have the underlying structure, right? You you just need to tokenize. I think uh, Baxter said that tokenize anything which is of value. And then you disintimidate the legal structure. But you can't do that unless the government are willing to have a token law or like in Singapore, we have the Omnibus law, which Singapore, maybe China, Thailand, and the Asia government, even Cambodia, they're moving ahead and dismantle the entire security act. You need to have a token act for this security token or token I call it token security is because it's a token first. And after you've been a token, let's say you tokenize a cow, you tokenize a tuition fee, you tokenize anything of value, and then you start to collateralize that, then it becomes a token security rather than a security, security token. So in that aspect, you will be able to convince the government and you have to revamp the entire security law, which is back way back. We all know how far back. And I think MAS is doing that. And a lot of other countries in Asia are relocating, especially those who are not financial center, because they have nothing to lose. They are not in the financial financial. That's, that's the reason why you see the first central bank digital currency that is on blockchain is from Cambodia, the Bakun project. Nowhere else has done it, and the rest of the people are just just talking about that. So uh, that that's my that's my view. We if we want this to take off, we have to think from the angle: how do we serve the society? and bring the rest of people back to the economic financial system. Thank, thanks, Prof. Uh, that's uh, certainly a very interesting one, right? Sounds like Asia is ahead of the game. Um, the next question here we have is for um, Baxter. Uh, why do you think that the private capital markets are still sort of operating in a very opaque, fragmented way? I mean, is, is, is STO still so new that it's not really, um, uh, you know, is, is it just at the early stages at, at the cusp of really uh, transforming the market? Well, what do you think is holding that back at the moment? Sure. I think the first thing that I would say is, you know, inertia is a very powerful force. People tend to continue to do what they've always done until there's a, a darn good reason to, to change their ways. And I think security tokens definitely have the benefits to do that, it's going to take time. And one of the biggest hurdles, in my opinion, is one of the reasons, you know, for doing webinars like this and for writing uh, the book that I've just put out, education is still probably one of the biggest hurdles to, to making uh, changes in the market. You know, um, I, when I was in the, the money management business, uh, you know, for, for many years, you know, I, I realized that not only are you selling a product, but you're selling confidence to investors. And they, as Professor Lee said, you've got to you've got to trust underlying security, and you've got to trust the technology. So there's that extra element there. Uh, I, I go back uh, many times when I talk about uh, you know this this new blo uh, blockchain adventure that we're all going uh, on right now, and, and compare it to the early days of the internet. And there's so many parallels that that I can remember, um, you know, from that period that I'm kind of seeing uh, unfolding today. So I, I my first job. Business. I worked for a brokerage uh, firm on the East Coast of the United States, and people were looking at, at internet companies uh, in, in the mid-90s, and that was really starting to take off. But you know, people were saying about the internet, you know, 
have you heard about these fools that are putting their credit card numbers on online and buying stuff? I mean, they're getting hacked. They're getting why? Why would you do that? That's so so foolish. Well, you know, today we have Amazon's the biggest company in the world, and they make a business off of again that efficiency. Um, you know, the internet at the time was seen as you know a lot of nefarious activity was was taking place on it, or people didn't really understand what it was. They knew it was sort of these computers talking to to one another, but you know, it did. It took time before it it really got mainstream. And so I think that's really uh, where we are with uh, security tokens and, and, and blockchain based uh, assets right now. It's just going to take some time for people to get up, up the learning curve. And, and uh, I think we're going on that journey right now. Great. Well, this is one way of uh, doing that education for, for folks out there who are curious. So that's good. Early adopters here. Um, next question we have uh, is for Alex. And this one comes from a very far away country uh, from Brazil. Uh, question for you, how's the Brazilian market for digital assets going? Is there one? Alex, you're on mute. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, so the Brazilian market is a very interesting market because the, historically, the CVM, which is the securities a uh, re government regulator of Brazil has historically followed almost to a T what the SEC in the United States deems to be um, reg new regulation, let's call it this way, right? So until today, because it has been very recent that the SEC in the United States allowed public offerings for security tokens. And it's very important to mention that in the United States, not uh, not to jump the, the gun on the question, you could, you could sell securities tokens to accredited investors without a problem, right? Under regulation D506, 506C or 506B, which is a difference between being allowing you to market it or not market it, you could sell it to accredited investors without a single issue. Um, and that was super clear. Now, how can you sell that to the average person? Uh, you know, the person that serves you coffee or that is not an accredited investor. And the SEC in the United States until July of last year was very on the fence of allowing this to happen, although we already had the regulatory framework that came all the way from the Obama administration. So historically, the CVM in Brazil uh, looks very much to the SEC in the United States to implement new regulations. So as of today, uh, security to securities cannot be tokenized in Brazil with two caveats to it. One is this new sandbox that just got released in Brazil for allowing innovative products and innovative projects to come into the market and push for new innovations. And, and from what I've been following and speaking with the regulatory uh, group in Brazil, the CVM, that's also considering security tokens. The other part of it, which is a very interesting part, is that some aspects of securities products, such as public debt or government debt, are not considered uh, securities in Brazil. So those have been traded or have been tokenized. Uh, Mercado Bitcoin, which is the largest crypto exchange in Latin America, has already tokenized a few offerings of uh, Brazilian public debt, both uh, state and, and federal. So we've, we're seeing evolutions in that space in Brazil. We're now seeing... Uh, also, uh, soccer teams tokenizing securities that are, are not that are not in the realm of considered as a full pledged security. So I think that there is a lot of promise there, and and obviously Brazil is one of the largest crypto markets in the world. So I'm very I'm very positive of the way this will unfold, and the team at CVM uh, is very forward thinking. So great things should come in the very near term. Great. 
I, I want to pick up this thread. You know, we, we talk a bit about uh, emerging markets like Brazil and, and Cambodia. This is a question for Prof. Uh, David, who spoke, and you know, you spoke a little bit about financial inclusion. No one pick up on that point. I mean, how do you think that a platform like iStocks, for example, right? I mean, we 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 at the moment are focused on accredited investors, but do you see potentially a platform like ourselves? Uh, really becoming a very powerful uh, tool for governments to think about. I mean, it doesn't have to be ISOC, but I'm saying ISOC like platforms within emerging markets and frontier markets to, to, to bring about financial inclusion, uh, whether it's in the private markets or, or public markets. Uh, what, what's your view? Well, I mean, let's focus on Asia, that this is going to happen quite soon. I think uh, uh, allow me to be a bit more adventurous. I see iStocks eventually as a smart contract, uh, you know, coding company that uh, deal with a lot of uh, DeFi trading because in the future, I think exchanges are not centralized and actually the exchanges will transform themselves into smart contract um, auditors as well as a liquidity pool provider. And I also see the entire system changing into banks as e-wallets. So you don't see banks around anymore. Banks are just e-wallet. So, you know, if you're looking into the future, um, as Alex and uh, Baxter was talking about, anything of value will be actually be traded. And what we have in the existing system is just a subset of the entire world with value. And a, a lot of a lot of trading that comes along will be using smart contracts because that's a real way to reduce the cost of trust. And given that if you look at how SEC in, in um, America is doing, Hester Pierce is pushing a lot uh, onto a lot of new agenda. And you can see where she's going. She has a safe harbor. She's looking into a lot of new tokenization. Uh, it's exactly what Alex is talking about, that it will be token security that we are all looking into. It is not security token. Although the name security token comes about because SEC wasn't very clear initially about how to deal with it. No government was clear about how to deal with it. But I think they now have a grip. And they all knew they don't know that the world has changed and they have to they, we, we need to come together and have a new token law and forget about the security law that we have to deal with that's another layer of cost that we need to do let's do away without that and i think to answer your question is that i think asia is able to do that because it's on a clean state it is not a financial center so there's no layers of historical baggage that they have to deal with and they can leap from so from from my perspective um I gave you the example of Bakun Project is because they, they leave from the rest of the world and uh, even Singapore is behind because we have to have our CBDC and China is also behind Cambodia, you know, and Bahamas has got a cent dollars, you know, as well as digital money. So you can see that the emerging market is leapfrogging in the financial space and certainly iStocks can play a major role in this transformation and I think MES is behind all this. I could see the hundred statement that they have every year for, for FinTech Festival is always about financial inclusion, is always about serving the society. And I think as, as a finance investor for 30 years, we really need to push the agenda mm -hmm. to, to because that is where the greatest return comes from for us as investors, as well as people who are involved in buying finance and not to be trapped in the old regulation. And we should go forward and encourage regulators and government to help us to generate more profit, including ice stocks. <laughs> well, as you said, it, it, this will be uh, great for, for everyone, right? I mean, it's for investors and, and wealth creation. So, you know, I think uh, regulators will be very focused. But, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the times when we do education sessions uh, we, and, and we try and explain the concept to investors, there's a lot of questions around uh, security, right? So, you know, this, this question is for Baxter, who's, who's actually invested uh, in, in a security token that is, uh, well, which the underlying is, you know, a basketball player's uh, 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 revenue, right? How did you, how do you as investors, or how do we think about getting investors comfortable or feeling safe or, or you know, what, what should investors look out for when they're investing in security tokens? I mean, I have an answer for that, but you know, certainly I'd, I'd love to hear Baxter, your view on that. Sure. I think that, you know, 
the first thing that, that I would mention to investors is just to realize that it, that what you're dealing with is the security token is is really just the same that you're dealing with in many ways uh, with with the traditional ways that you you've bought securities. It's just you're now going to a digital and and blockchain based format. It's really not that different and. What you need to look at with these investments is obviously first the underlying investment because no matter how you package it up or how you you sell it, if it's a bad investment, you are a bad company, you don't want to be involved with it. So obviously, start with the fundamentals. But the other things that I would look for, like take with the Spencer Dinwiddie token, you look for things like you know who is the custodian behind the assets or who are the people servicing these um, these assets. What's their reputation like? What are their procedures that that they follow. You could get a lot of additional safeguards by sticking with you know, familiar partners, by sticking with uh, companies or, or organizations that have you know, a good track record and, and good reputations out in, in the marketplace. So in the case of Spencer Dinwiddie with, with Paxos, that was a, uh, a, a great company here in the United States that had its own stable coins that were paying the, uh, you know, paying the interest uh, to me and to the other investors. They were doing all the, the, the custody over the life insurance contracts on, that, that are, are connected to him. So that's another safeguard uh, that, that, that we have. Um, they were monitoring all the smart contracts because he was required at certain dates to put in certain money into, into escrow accounts. You know, you've got a good partner like, uh, uh, like Paxos. We also knew the broker dealer uh, that, was, that was issuing this security and, and, and raising the investors. So I think that's that kind of stuff is is all very very important. And if I could, I just add a little bit to the question that you just had about emerging markets. Um, that was a big part of my background. I, I spent most of my time helping U.S. investors get uh, access to investments uh, outside of the U.S. And, and emerging markets were a big part of that. One of the things that really helped investors uh, find those uh, opportunities was the ADR market here in the US um, uh, and the GDR markets in, in, in other countries. So American depository receipts or global depository receipts. And that was a big draw to me about this technology as I saw how the ADRs were structured, how they were literally just a receipt. It was just that. It said that you have, by holding this receipt, you have ownership rights to uh, a security that's held in a custodian's vault. That's really all an ADR was. And so in the case of uh, emerging markets and international markets, you, you can do a similar type of thing with security tokens to give access to um, these, these emerging market in, investments. And I think, if, again, if they're, they're packaged properly, if they're w- working in, a, in a, a jurisdiction like Singapore, I know we, we used to buy uh, different Indonesian and Filipino investments through the, the Singapore Stock Exchange when I was running an emerging markets portfolio, you can do similar types of stuff to get investors into to emerging markets through the security token uh, path. That's a, that's a very interesting analogy. I'm going to use that uh, uh, someday. Um, you know, ADRs and GDRs are still relatively, I think Singapore is trying to do an SDR, uh, but that okay. has really taken off. Um, uh, the next question is around sort of what 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 uh, for Alex? Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers to the broader adoption? Well, what are the biggest hurdles we need to cross? Sorry, Alex, you're on mute. Keep putting myself on mute. Sorry for that. Um, I I think that like you mentioned, Oi, um, there's two parts of it of the whole security token ecosystem that need to be solved, right? And Professor Lee did a great job at at emphasizing, well, the SEC, who is the the global ruling government, wasn't sure how to deal with it. So those two parts, in my opinion, are tech and reg tech or regulation, depending on, on which jurisdiction you're in. Some jurisdictions have more clear regulatory frameworks like Singapore, which in 2014 was one, if not the most forward thinking country in the world for digital assets by uh, allowing people to trade them and taxing them. So definitely props for you guys at iStocks for choosing, in my opinion, the most forward thinking jurisdiction. Uh, So you have those two, two parts. I think that tech is 
close to being fully solved. Uh, one of the key aspects we're trying to solve is which standard of token will will be the, the winning standard, right? And, and if we go back to the beginning eras of the internet, and I'm old enough to, to remember those, uh, TCIP was the winning protocol. And not necessarily TCIP was the only one. Um, it, it was just like the most scalable and adopted one. And we're going in that direction of defining what tech will be the ruling protocol. I think that that's easy. I don't think we're going to have too many issues with that. And you guys at iStox is doing a great job at helping helping disseminate that um, that thought process. I think that the other side of it is re is regulation, and how clear it is uh, for platforms, issuing platforms, token issuers, or companies that want to raise money or or um, put out financial products in their jurisdiction to issue these uh, products. Um, obviously with, with, the, with the leadership of the SEC, that's becoming easier because a lot of you, the people want to under, have to understand that across the globe, if you go to the MAS, the MAS is one of the most fantastic regula <laughs> regulatory teams in the world. You, you go there, it's like five stars, right? They have a huge building. They treat you like five stars. Uh, they are fully aware of what security tokens are, even in 2016, when we started having conversations with them. Uh, that's not the case around the world. Some of these jurisdictions have really small teams. And these teams are not only looking at security tokens, but they're also looking at the whole broad scope of securities. So having some of the most forward thinking and important regu regulatory teams uh, lead that discussion and, and trailblaze with clear frameworks and guidelines like the MAS is doing, I think it's gonna help a lot of these emerging markets and, uh, and other teams to, to do so. Um, I'll leave an example because the previous question was about Brazil. Uh, the CVM in Brazil, which is the regulating body for the entire country for securities is a little over 200 people. That's a small team. There, there are companies in the blockchain space that have more people than that. Uh, so, you know, I think that, that those are the two hurdles. Uh, but as soon as, as we cross the technology line and we have more clear on the regulatory side coming from regulating bodies like the MAS, like the SEC, I think it will, it will be uh, a lot more easy for emerging markets to also adopt this. And security tokens is really, really a, a fantastic solution for emerging markets. Agreed, agreed. Well, we have time for one last question. So I'm going to ask all of you, uh, three gentlemen tonight, the one last question. So if we can take turns from uh, Prof. David to Baxter Alex. The last question is, if you had one minute to tell a skeptic, what would, you know, you had one minute to sell, you know, security tokens to a skeptic, what would your, um, what would it be? Prof. David, let's go. <laughs> I think um, let's use a very broad definition of security tokens than anything that, and, and, uh, and token security. I think if I have one minute, I would just say that, you know, whatever um, technology that we have, and especially now in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, blockchain is a technology. And it's important whatever we do in finance that uh, we have to serve the society. And if we do that, uh, and certainly security token can do a lot of good of the society but it's all the design thinking. And if we put our brains together with the regulators and the technologists and make sure that we design something that gain the trust of the people, security token is definitely the way to go forward. Great. Baxter, your turn. Sure. I would say that you know blockchain over the last 10 years has really proven itself as an incredible way to transfer both value and information. Uh, it's a, a trustless, immutable type of, of source of, uh, of data, and it's something that is just only going to get, get bigger over time. And I really believe that we are at a tipping point with these, these digital assets 
if you think about like what I'm saying from uh, about adoption from say a, a framework that like uh, an author like Matt, Malcolm Gladwell would talk about, he says, you know, you, a new trend comes along or a new idea and people kind of don't really pay much attention to it. It takes time for that, that to happen. Uh, it gets shunned. Sometimes it even gets retaliated against. We're certainly seeing that with, with blockchain. But then there comes a moment, which he again calls the tipping point, where things really, really start to turn and it just becomes, uh, you know, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that, 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 that the, the idea takes off. And, and I really do believe that's where we are with blockchain today. So fasten your seatbelts. I think we're, we're really about to, to take, uh, take off and see an inflection and adoption. Yep, I'm, I'm feeling that too. Um, Alex, your, what's your one minute? Um, my, mine is pretty straightforward. I, I like to think it about like, and I tell this to my students. So think about traditional securities as paper and pan ladders, right? You used to write them on a paper, use a pan, send it to the mail, and then hope that it will get to the other side of the world in, in a timely fashion. That, it would, that you're expecting that communication to get. And that's exactly what was the old securities market. And security tokens are like the email. You, you can build a lot more fancy models of it. You can, you, you can make a much nicer ladder, a much more creative ladder, and you can spread it across the globe in a time zero uh, model. Right. And, and you can spread it around to anyone in the world and and really have a much broader uh, distribution of of your of your security. So think about security tokens as um, as the email for paper and pen letters. Fantastic. I think that's uh, another great analogy I will be using uh, quite often now. Great. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, we have taken a lot of your time this evening. I know everybody's got a long day ahead and Prof. David, you know, it's, it's late for you as well. Uh, we had a great audience. Uh, there were many, many questions and they were, seem to have come from all over the world. So that's great. I think, uh, Nigel, you want to flash the last slide just as, as a reminder of the two uh, books that everyone should be buying right now. I think uh, we've kind of lost Nigel's slides. But again, uh, look out for Baxter and Alex's uh, books. They're available on Amazon. Uh, we're super excited. And again, anybody who needs some copies, please reach out to the ISOC team. We'd be happy to get some for you. Um, and Prof. David, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Alex and, and Baxter, thank you so much for your time. Um, we'd love to have you back again, uh, maybe sometime next year to find out, you know, what's next. Maybe the tipping point has happened and we're going to have a very different uh, discussion and audience uh, right here. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good evening and we'll speak to you very soon. Thanks, Oye. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.